Welcome to part six of History, Fiction, or Science by A.T. Fomenko, Chronology 1, read by John McTemus, starting in section 10 of chapter 1, and a quick review. Uh, last time, Fomenko uh, spent a good deal of time commenting on the problems that we have uh, conveying history and geography, and um, I would think he's he's also um, aiming at chronology uh, from a language that uh, he believes is is represented only uh, consonantally, which would be um, Hebrew. Although, uh, as I said in the last video, he's uh, he's building from a foundation of uh, Masoretic dictate concerning Hebrew, which I am very much against. Um, this idea that it it didn't even have vowels, and and that there was uh, nothing about the language that was standardized before the Masoretes. Uh, it is my contention that the Masoretes simply confused the language rather than actually standardized it. Now, uh, one thing that I didn't think of last time uh, concerning uh, what he had said about language in the Masoretes, and it was funny that he also commented that um, Slavic as well is nothing more in his eyes than strings of consonants. The thing I find interesting about that is that uh, when I did the reading of uh, Michael Hoffman's They Were White and They Were Slaves. Uh, he uh, had written that actually some of the earliest known slaves of the Roman Empire were whites. And it is actually where the name slave comes from were the Slavs. Slaves, Slavs. Interesting that they should have a language that at least in the sense of one looking at the language from the outside and commenting on its strange nature in being a string of consonants. Anyways, uh, he also went into the, <laughs> the rather large-scale deception concerning uh, Palestine, Egypt and the outlying areas, and how it's been sold to the world that this is the location uh, of biblical events. Although um, everything that I've seen thus far concerning landscape, uh, geography, and specifics tells me that uh, there's no possible way. I had one subscriber actually uh, wrote me weeks, I think weeks ago, and it pointed out um, the fact that during the Feast of Sukkot, or booths, or tabernacles, uh, the people were to take willow branches, for one thing, and build their booths. Well, we're talking about a lot of people, first off, okay? A lot of people. So that's a lot of willow branches. And willows need water. They drink up water. Um, and uh, in the Bible, actually, there's uh, at least a, a small number of passages talking about willows by brooks and streams. Again, this landscape is not matching uh, the landscape of Palestine and the outlying areas, and Egypt as well. Nothing seems to add up. And when you consider uh, the sorts of personalities that have been involved in these major uh, archaeological discoveries, and then consider the makeup of the archaeological discoveries, <laughs> and then consider at the same time as these... Uh, discoveries were being made in uh, the areas of Egypt, Sinai, 
uh, lower Palestine and uh, to the east of there, in fact, which Fomenko's, uh, I'm assuming, going to get into if he's going to talk about Babylon. Um, at about the same time, we have uh, the leading institution for the suppression of artifacts and archaeological evidence in the United States, the Smithsonian, commissioning men to, for one thing, explore the Grand Canyon for artifacts. That, in fact, from everything that I've found thus far, there are actually more Hebrew-related and Phoenician-related and Egyptian or Mutsri, Mutsri related artifacts found of all places in the United States. And these artifacts, uh, as well as giants, I've commented on those, not far from where I live, one of the most important giant finds, I think, of uh, recorded history that I know of, in full armor, by the way. Um, and these are being found by regular folks, farmers mostly, that are trying to dig up their land and, and they find all of these various artifacts. Now, when you consider that most of the artifacts found in the United States are being found by regular Joes and thus being covered up, while at the same time all of these artifacts are being found in the area of Palestine and Egypt by people who are either knights or become knighted, get MBEs, are, um, uh, you look at their, their family history, and they are definitely in the in crowd or I mean people who are working for uh, British and, and Dutch East India Company um, just the most nefarious sorts of characters with the, the worst kind of connections are the folks finding the artifacts over around Palestine and Egypt I think it's a head scratcher so everything that Fomenko provided in that previous section with all of his bibliographical numbers which I would just have to imagine are a treasure trove of information refuting the possibility that these events took place in and around Palestine and Egypt and that's enough for my forward commentary but now on to section 10 ancient historical events geographic localization issues 10.1 the locations of Troy and Babylon the correct geographic location of a large number of ancient historical events is truly a formidable task Naples for instance whose name merely stands for new town is reflected in the ancient chronicles as the following cities 1. Naples in Italy, existing to this day. 2. Carthage, also translating as New Town. Naples in Palestine. And the Scythian Naples. See the collection of State History Museum of Moscow. And 5. New Rome, a.k.a. Constantinople, or Tsargrad. That's C-Z-A-R, as in the Russian Tsar, or maybe Caesar, or maybe Kaiser. Anyways, maybe Khazars. Tsargrad, which could also be referred to as Newtown. Thus, if a chronicle is referring to an event that occurred in Naples, one has to devote all of one's attention to making sure one understands which town is meant. Troy may be seen as yet another example. One of the consensual localizations for Homer's Troy is near the Hellespont Straits. Schliemann 
use this hypothesis for solemnly baptizing as, quote, Troy, the 100 by 100 meter excavation site of a minuscule ancient settlement that he had discovered near the Hellespont. Actually, the very localization of Hellespont itself is highly controversial. See Chronicles 2 for more details. The Scaligerian chronology and history tells us that Homer's Troy met its final fate of destruction and utter desolation in the 7th through 8th century BC. However, we know that the Italian town of Troy played an important role in medieval history, particularly in the well-known war of the 8th century. This town still exists. Many Byzantine historians of the Middle Ages refer to Troy as an existing medieval town. Among them, Nicetus Aconitus and Nesiphorus Gregorus. Hmm. Those are the historians, I'm sorry. A lot of footnotes in there. According to Titus Livy, Troy and the entire Trojan region were located in Italy, volume 1, pages 3 and 4. He tells us that the surviving Trojans landed in Italy soon after the fall of Troy, and that the place of their first landing was called Troy. Quote, Aeneas wound up in Sicily. His fleet sailed thenceforth and came to the Laurentian region. This place is called Troy as well. Several medieval historians identify Troy as Jerusalem. For instance, um, and then he gives footnotes or uh, references to the bibliography. This fact embarrasses modern historians greatly, leading them to such comments as, quote, Homer's actual book somewhat suddenly turns into an account of the devastation of Jerusalem. In a medieval text describing Alexander's arrival in Troy, from A.T. Fomenko, Anna Komnina, a medieval author, somewhat unexpectedly locates Jerusalem in Ithaca, the island where Ulysses was born. This is most peculiar indeed, since it is known perfectly well that modern Jerusalem isn't located on an island. I gotta stop there. And I gotta stop there because there's something to the language I've been noticing concerning Jerusalem. And what it's called, Tsiyun, Tsiyun. If you look at the root Tsi and Un actually being a, a diminutive, okay, the root Tsi is often translated as ships or sailors, uh, something having to do with, uh, with water or uh, travel by water. So I've... I've 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 kind of found that strange, and I have to interject that. Okay, all right. Um, another name for Troy is Ilion, while Jerusalem is also known as Elia Capitolina. Elia and Ilion are rather close phonetically. It is possible that the same city was called Troy and Ilion by some, and Jerusalem and Elia by others. That is A-E-L-I-A, -E so Aelia, maybe, and I-L-I-O-N, like I-Lion. Eusebius Pamphilus writes that somebody, quote, referred to the small Phrygian towns Petusa and Timion as Jerusalem. The facts quoted above demonstrate the fact that the name of Troy had multiplied in the Middle Ages and had been used for referring to different cities. Could an archetypal medieval original have existed? Scalagerian chronology contains information that allows the construction of the hypothesis that Homer's Troy was really Constantinople or Tsargrad.
Apparently, the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great took into account the wish of his fellow townsmen and, quote, had initially chosen the place where the ancient Ilion, the fatherland of the first founders of Rome, had been located, unquote. This is what the prominent Turkish historian Jalal Assad tells us in his Constantinople. Historians proceed to tell us that Constantine, quote, changed his mind afterwards and founded New Rome nearby in the town of Byzantium. But it is known, it is a known fact in Scaligerian history that Ilion is another name for Troy. What we encounter here may well be a reminder of the fact that the same town located on the Bosphorus has been referred to by different names. Troy, New Rome, Tsargrad, Jerusalem. It might also be true that since Naples means New Town, it was the name that had been used for New Rome as well. Let us mention the fact that southern Italy used to be called the Great Greece in the Middle Ages. Nowadays, it is assumed that the city of Babylon was located in modern Mesopotamia. Some of the medieval texts hold a cardinally different opinion. The well-known book, Serbian Alexandria, for instance, locates Babylon in Egypt. Moreover, it tells us that Alexander the Great died in Egypt as well. According to the Scaligerian version, this event took place in Mesopotamia. Furthermore, we see that, quote, Babylon is the Greek name of the settlement that had been located opposite the pyramids. In the Middle Ages, it had been a frequently used name for Cairo, whose suburb this settlement eventually became. The name Babylon can be translated as well as the names of many other cities, and thus may have been used for referring to other locations. Eusebius tells us that Rome used to be called Babylon. Furthermore, the Byzantine historians, often called Baghdad, Babylon. Uh, Michael Silas, P-S-E-L-L-U-S, -L -L the author of the alleged 11th century, refers to Babylon as one would to an existing town, not a destroyed one. In figure 1.37, which I do not have on, there it is, um, yes, no, nope, it's the last one. I'm sorry. In figures 1.37, we can see an ancient miniature dating from 1470, depicting, in quotes, ancient. Babylon is a typically medieval Gothic town. The Tower of Babel is being constructed on the right. The, quote, ancient King Nimrod is also portrayed as a medieval knight in plate armor. Modern commentators deem this to be a fantasy bearing little semblance to reality. Quote, on the left we see Babylon presented as a fantasy Gothic town with elements of Muslim architecture. The giant in the center is Nimrod. The construction of the Tower of Babel is pictured on the right. It is most probable, however, that this is not a fantasy. The artist had been perfectly aware of what he was painting, and the picture reflects medieval reality. 10.2. The geography of Herodotus is at odds with the Scaligerian version. Let us quote some examples from Herodotus, who plays a key role in the Scaligerian chronology. He claims the African River Nile to be parallel to Eister, that is nowadays identified <clears throat> as the Danube, and oddly enough, not Deniester, D-N-I-E-S-T-E-R. This is where we find out that, quote, the opinion that Danube and Nile were parallel reigned in the medieval Europe until as late as the end of the 13th century. How interesting. Thus, the mistake of Herodotus proves to be 
medieval in its origins. Herodotus proceeds to tell us that, quote, the Persians inhabit all of Asia to the very southern sea, that is also called the Red Sea. According to consensual geography, the southern sea is the Persian Gulf, giving a description of the peninsula that contemporary historians identify with the Arabian Peninsula. Herodotus writes that, quote, it begins near the Persian land and stretches to the Red Sea. Everything appears to be correct here. However, this contradicts the opinion of those historians who identify the Red Sea mentioned by Herodotus as the Persian Gulf. This is why modern commentators hasten to, quote, correct Herodotus. Uh, quote, Red Sea stands for Persian Gulf here. And that's in the appendices, part 4, comment 34. Let us continue. The Red Sea, in its modern interpretation, and I'll get to these maps page here, in its modern interpretation, may indeed, quote, reach further up than the Persians, unquote, according to Herodotus, but only meeting one condition, namely that the map used by Herodotus was inverted in relation to the ones used nowadays. Many medieval maps are like that, with north and south swapped. This makes the modern historians identify the Red Sea as the Persian Gulf. Appendix Part 4, Comment 36. Although the Persian Gulf is, quote, below the Persians in this case, or to the east of them, but doesn't reach, quote, further up, at any rate. Historians identify the same sea mentioned by Herodotus in 2.102 as the Indian Ocean. What we observe here is the inversion of the east and the west. Could the map that Herodotus have used have been an inverted one then? In Book 4.37, Herodotus identifies the Red Sea as the South Sea, QV above. Um, and apparently one of these maps may be what he's referring to that I have on screen. This proves to be the final straw of confusion for the modern commentators who try to fit Herodotus into the Procrustean Procrustean geography of the Scaligerian school and the maps used nowadays. They are forced to identify the red, or in, in uh, parentheses, southern sea, as the Black Sea. We see yet another inversion of the east and west in relation to the Persians, thus identifying the geographic data as offered by Herodotus with the Scaligerian map runs us into many difficulties. The numerous corrections that the modern historians are forced to make show us that the map that Herodotus had used may have been inverted in relation to the modern ones, which is a typical trait of medieval maps. As we can see, the commentators have to make a conclusion that Herodotus uses different names to refer to the same seas in his history. If we're to believe the modern historians, we have to think that Herodotus makes the following identifications. Red Sea equals South Sea equals Black Sea equals North Sea equals the Mediterranean equals the Persian Gulf equals Our Sea equals Indian Ocean. Yikes. The mentions of the Crestonians, the town of Creston, and the region of Crocea sound most peculiar coming from an allegedly ancient author. One constantly gets the feeling that he is referring to the medieval crusaders, or in quotes cross, and in quotes crest, are the roots one most often associates with the Middle Ages. Just how voracious are the datings of the events related by Herodotus? 
The unbiased analysis of biblical geography yields many oddities as well. Ah, you're darn tootin' they do. Section 10.3, the inverted maps of the Middle Ages. Modern maps place the east on the right and the west on the left. However, we find that the opposite is true for many medieval maps. All of the sea charts of the alleged 14th century had the east on the left and the west on the right. QV in the Atlas, 1468. Some of these old inverted charts from Genoa can be seen in figures 1.38, 1.39, 1.40, and 1.41. Okay, there we go. These charts may have been used by either traders or the military fleet. The word Levant, for instance, still means Oriental in French. The Middle East is often referred to as Levant in German. This may be a reflection of the fact that the Orient was on the left of the maps. Levi, uh, Levi L -E -V -I -Y, means left in Russian, and the adverb for on the left is sleva. It is possible that the Russian word levi was adopted by some of the Western European languages in order to refer to the Orient. See our parallelism glossary in Chronology 7. Why did the old maps and sea charts in particular have the east on their left and the west on their right? The reason may have been that the first seafarers of Europe would sail forth from the seaports located on the European coast of the Mediterranean, as well as the Black and Azov seas, and so they had to move from the north to the south. The south was therefore in front, and the northern coast behind them. A ship captain sailing into the Mediterranean from the Bosphorus would look at the approaching African coast, thus the east was on the left and the west was on the right. This is why the first sea charts of both the traders and the military put the east on the left. It made sense to put that which lay in front on the top of the map. Thus, the way one looks at the map corresponds with the direction of one's movement. Section 11, a modern analysis of biblical geography. All right. The fact that many biblical texts clearly refer to volcanic activity has been well known to historians for a long time. The word Zion, Tsiyun, is widely known Theologians interpret it as pillar. Identifying Zion as Sinai and Horeb is common in both theology and Bible studies, not that I'm aware of. Hieronymus in particular noted that, quote, it appears that the same mountain is called by two different names, Sinai and Horeb, correct. I Palmialovsky wrote that, quote, the Old Testament often identifies it, Mount Horeb, as Sinai. Mount Zion can be translated as the Pillar Mountain. <laughs> the Bible explicitly describes Mount Sinai slash Zion slash Horeb as a volcano below. In this case, the Pillar Mountain makes sense in the way of referring to a pillar of smoke above the volcano. We shall be referring to God as the thunderer below, following the interpretation suggested in 544, Volume 2. According to the Bible, quote, The Lord Yahweh said unto Moshe, Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud upon Mount Sinai. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. There were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount, 
and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, and Mount Sinai was altogether in smoke, because Yahweh descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly, and when the voice of the trumpet sounded long, and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and Alaim, God, answered him by a voice. <clears throat> That's from Exodus 19. Also, quote, And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings, and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. Exodus 20, 18. In figure 1.42, we can see an ancient engraving from a 1558 Bible, the Biblia Sacra. The medieval painter portrays Moses Masha ascending a fiery mountain. Furthermore, quote, The day that thou stoodest in Horeb, and the mountain burned with fire unto the midst of heaven with darkness, clouds and thick darkness, and Yahweh spake unto you out of the midst of the fire, ye heard the voice of the words, but saw no similitude, only ye heard a voice from Deuteronomy 4, 10 through 12. The destruction of the biblical cities of Sodom and Gomorrah has long been considered a result of volcanic eruption. The Bible says that, quote, the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. In Genesis 19:24 and 1928. By the way, if I miss it and forget to switch over the translation, whenever you hear the Lord, it is the name used by the God of the Bible, Yahweh. On Albrecht Durer's engraving, quote, Lot fleeing with his daughters from Sodom, we can see a volcanic eruption destroying the biblical cities of the plain in a fountain of fire and stones. Let us turn to the Lamentations of Jeremiah that contain a description of the destruction of Jerusalem. It is assumed to be an account of the destruction of the city by a hostile army, an hostile army. However, the text contains many fragments such as, quote, how hath Yahweh covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud in his anger, and remembered not his footstool in the day of his anger? Yahweh hath swallowed up all the habitations. He burned like a flaming fire which devoureth round about. From the Lamentations of Jeremiah 2, 1 through 3. Then we encounter the following in the chapters 3 and 4 of the Lamentations. Quote, I am the man that hath seen affliction by the rod of his, that being Alaim or Yahweh's, wrath. He hath led me and brought me into darkness, but not into light. He hath broken my bones. He hath enclosed my ways with hewn stone. He hath made my paths crooked. He hath also broken my teeth with gravel stones. He hath covered me with ashes. Thou hast covered me with anger and persecuted us. Thou hast slain. Thou hast not pitied. Thou hast covered thyself with a cloud. The stones of the sanctuary are poured out. The punishment is greater than the punishment of the sin of Sodom. Their visage is blacker than coal. The Lord hath accomplished his fury, he hath poured out his fierce anger, and hath kindled a fire in Siun. It hath devoured the foundations thereof. From the Lamentations of Jeremiah, mostly chapters 3 and 4. Theologians insist all of this is metaphorical. However, a literal reading of the text divulges an account of the destruction of a large city by a volcanic eruption. The Bible refers to volcanic activity quite often. Here's a list of all such references compiled by V.P. Fomenko and T.G. Fomenko. Well, now this is quite a list, folks. He's saying, 
Genesis 19, 18 and 24, Exodus 13, 21 and 22, Exodus 14, 18, Exodus 20, 15, Exodus 24, 15, 16 and 17, Numbers 14, 14, Numbers 21, 28, Numbers 26, 10, Deuteronomy 4, 11 and 36, Deuteronomy 5, 19, 20 and 21, Deuteronomy 9, 15, 21, Deuteronomy 10, 4, Deuteronomy 33, 22, the second book of Samuel 22, 8 through 10 and 13, the first book of the Kings 18, 38 and 39, the first book of the Kings, 19, 11, and 12, the second book of the Kings, 1, 10, 12, 14, Nehemiah, 9, 12, and 19, the book of Psalms, in parentheses, Psalm 11, verse 6, Psalm 106, verse 17, uh, close parenthesis, open parenthesis, Psalm 106, verse 18, close parenthesis, Ezekiel 38, 22, Jeremiah 48, 45, the Lamentations of Jeremiah 2, 3, the Lamentations of Jeremiah 4, 11, Isaiah 4, 5, Isaiah 5, 25, Isaiah 9, 17, 18, Isaiah 10, 17, Isaiah 30, 30, and Joel 2, 3, 5, and 10. Did you get that? I would think... If I've got, I put the address of this book in every single reading. I would think it would be awesome if um, one of my listeners were to take that list. Okay, remember, um, that list is in section 11 of the first chapter. Take that list and, and see if those references seem very strong or not. Because you have to remember these, these references in these passages he's given where he's trying to argue for the presence of volcanic activity um, in, in or around the promised land or lands uh, described in the Bible. Um, he's not taking certain uh, linguistics and um, um, lexicographical uh, problems and anomalies into account, and that's fine. But, anyways, that that would be a very good list right there to to double check on. So, uh, uh, back to the reading. Uh, seeing these descriptions as referring to Jerusalem in Palestine and the traditional Mount Sinai, is very odd indeed. Since Mount Sinai, located on the modern Sinai Peninsula, had never been a volcano. Where did the events really take place then? I'd like to know. It suffices to study the geographic map of the Mediterranean region to see that there are no volcanoes on the Sinai Peninsula and there aren't any either in Syria or Palestine. There are zones of tertiary and quad <laughs> quaternary volcanic activity I'm sorry, I've never gotten past tertiary in my life. It's quaternary volcanic activity. But one encounters those in the vicinity of Paris as well. Uh, there has been no, no volcanic activity recording in documented history. The only relevant geographic zone that possesses powerful volcanoes active to this day in this area, <clears throat> including Italy and Sicily, uh, since there are no volcanoes in Egypt or anywhere in the north of Africa, we are looking for one, a powerful volcano that was active in the historical epoch, two, a destroyed capital near the volcano, see the Lamentations of Jeremiah, and three, two more destroyed cities near the volcano, Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay. Uh, there's just one volcano in the entire Mediterranean area that fits these criteria, and that's Vesuvius. It is one of the most powerful volcanoes active in the historical period. The famous Pompeii, a capital, and two destroyed cities, Stabia, maybe Sodom, and Herculaneum, maybe Gomorrah. The names do possess a slight similarity. <sighs> N. A. Marizov was of the opinion that the origin for the name Sinai given to Vesuvius is the Latin word sinus or sino in Old Latin, quote, mountain with bowels, unquote. <laughs> and Horeb has its origins in the Latin word horribilis or horrible. 
Um, in 544, we can see the results of an interesting research that Morozov conducted concerning the biblical text as read without vocalizations. And considering the localization of Mount Sinai slash Horeb slash Zion in Italy. And you know I'm going to be commenting about that. Let us quote several examples. The Bible says, quote, Yahweh, our Alayim, spake unto us in Horeb, saying, Ye have dwelt long enough in this mount. Turn you and take your journey to the land of the Canaanites. From Deuteronomy 1, 6 and 7. Theologians vocalize Kinun as Canaan and localize it in a desert near the Dead Sea coast, but another vocalization is possible. Kanun or Kanoa as a variant of Genoa, the area of Genoa in Italy. Apart from that, the word Canaan sounds like the land of the Khans. The Bible gives the direction as, quote, to the land of Canun, the Canaanites, and unto Lebanon. Le he has L-B-N-U-N, which is basically, yeah, that's the English equivalent of these letters, Lebanon. Um, I, would, I, I would pronounce it Lebanon. Doesn't matter. Probably. Deuteronomy 1-7. That is commonly vocalized as Lebanon. However, um, Lebanon, which is L-B-N-U-N, is often used for white. That's correct. And may have been used to refer to Mount Blanc, the White Mountain. Literally, the land of the Canaanites may mean the same as the Khans, K-H-A-N, Khans, land, or the land of the Khan. Furthermore, we see, quote, unto the great river, the river Parath, not Parat, Parath, in Deuteronomy 1.7. Parath is localized as Euphrates. However, what lies beyond Mont Blanc is the river Danube with its large tributary Prut. The Bible says, when we departed from Horeb, we went through all that great and terrible wilderness. Deuteronomy 119. The famous Phlegrian fields that are located near Vesuvius, Horeb, fit this description perfectly. Large area of scorched land full of small volcanoes, fumaroles, and layers of lava. According to the Bible, the Israelites, quote, came to Kadesh Barnea, not V. I, the, the B is not pronounced V. Kadesh Barnea. Deuteronomy 119. Kadesh Barnea is vocalized as Kadesh Barnea. However, the town in question may well be Cadiz upon the Rhone. Cadiz on the Rhone might be another name of the modern Geneva, or indeed the Bulgarian city of Varna. Further, in the Bible we see, quote, And we compassed Mount Seir many days, Deuteronomy 2.1. Theologians left the word Seir without translation. If we translate it, we shall get, quote, The Devil's Mountain. Eh, a mountain by this name exists near Lake Geneva, Mount Diableret, quote, the Devil's Mountain. The sons of Lot encountered on the way may well be the Latin population. The River Arnon, <clears throat> A-R-N, and, and he leaves out the U, it's A-R-N-U-N, Arnun, is mentioned in Deuteronomy 2.24. This may well be the Italian river Arno. The Israelites, quote, went up the way to Bashan. According to Deuteronomy 3.1, the town of Bashan is often mentioned by the Bible. Amazingly enough, a town by the name of Bassano still exists in Italy. Um, I'm sorry I have to interject again. Bashan, um, you read the accounts in the Bible, Bashan is... Um, described as um, kind of more of a region um, 
Anyways. Okay. Uh, according to the Bible, there was not a city which we took not from them three score cities. Indeed, many large towns were located in this area in the Middle Ages. Verona, Padua, Ferrara, Bologna, etc. And I'm sorry, no, Bashan, I'm so sorry, is a city, I'm sorry, the region is Galan. My apologies. The Bible mentions the land, quote, from the river of Arnun unto Mount Hermon, or Hermon, in Deuteronomy 3.8. However, the Hermon Mountains can also be vocalized as the German mountains. Quote, for only Og, it was be Ug, uh, for only Ug, king of Bashan, remained. His bedstead, um, Fomenko interprets that as coffin, was a bedstead of iron. Um, is it not in Rabath of the children of Ammon? Deuteronomy 3.11. Uh, Rabath is Ravenna, and the coffin of Ug, he puts in uh, brackets, Goth. Uh, question mark, uh, is the sepulchre of Theodoric the Goth located in Ravenna. Theodoric is supposed to have lived in 493 through 526 AD, so this biblical text could not have appeared before the 6th century AD, even in Scaligerian chronology. <laughs> The Israelites are supposed to have stopped at Tibre or the place Tibera, Numbers 11.3. Bearing the previous identifications in mind, we can recognize the Italian river Tiber in this name. Uh, furthermore, uh, CN is Siena to the southeast from Livorno. The biblical Hebron, Habrun, Genesis 23.2, is possibly Gorgo de Hron. The slopes of Monteviso are called Jebus or Vuz, Buz in Judges 19.10. The city of Rome is called Hrama in Judges 19.3. All the quotes are from the authorized version of the Bible, and there are many more examples. And I do want to interject again what I mentioned a couple of videos ago, that um, one of the children of Cush, um, his name is translated Rama, but uh, the letters, um, when written out in their um, generic, shemitic, English equivalent is R-O-M-E. It is thus possible that a part of the events described in the Bible, namely the journey of the Israelites led by Moses and their subsequent conquest of the, quote, promised land with Joshua took place in Europe and particularly in Italy. The localization of the, quote, ancient states mentioned in the Bible also raises a vast number of questions. The Bible often mentions the Phoenician towns of Tyre and Sidon. It would be Tyr and Sidon. Since we now allow for possibilities of medieval interpretations of many biblical names, one cannot fail to notice the similarities between the names of Venetia and Phoenicia. They may well be the same name if we consider the usual rules of flexion. One comes up with the hypothesis of vocalizing the biblical Phoenicia as the medieval Venice. Indeed, the Bible describes the ancient Phoenicia as a powerful nation of seafarers that reigned over the entire Mediterranean. The... Really? I'm sorry, folks. No, it doesn't call them the ancient Phoenician seafarers that reigned over the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean is not in the Bible. With colonies in Sicily, Spain, and Africa. Again, the Bible doesn't say that. Quote, ancient Phoenicians traded extensively with faraway lands, as can be seen in the book of Ezekiel chapter 27. All of these biblical criteria are met by the medieval Venetian Republic, a well-known and powerful state. 
The Scaligerian history claims the principal Phoenician towns to have been modern Tyre and Sidon. Do these towns fit their biblical descriptions of lavishness and splendor? A 14th century volume of sailing directions for seamen tells us the following about Saida, S-A-I-D-A. Quote, the town had 1,600 inhabitants in 1818. There is a small bay to the south, a small pier that is barely visible in our day. It used to belong to a small harbor that is now completely covered by the sands. Plague often rages fiercely here. One finds no traces of former splendor in Saida nowadays. There's a reef on the south end and it's very shallow in the north. The depth between the town and the island is uneven. The passage is narrow, and the bottom is full of stones. A large ship's boat cannot come close to the shore, which makes it impossible to replenish water supply here. The town is located in the estuary of a river that isn't navigable by ships. Its main means of survival in the 14th century had been the local gardens. Strategically speaking, Saida's location is perfectly hopeless. It used to belong to virtually everyone during the Crusades epoch. There are no records mentioning it as a large independent trade center. All of this contradicts the biblical descriptions of the greatness of Sidon and Phoenicia. The situation with Tyr is similar. Evidently, the Bible is referring to other locations. Okay, so I'm going to pick up with section 12 of chapter 1 uh, in the next recording because uh, section 12 is in itself quite lengthy. And um, I... I have a number of comments, of course, because of specifically the subject matter we're talking about. Now, I don't intend in these comments to, to per se, just, uh, just tear up Fomenko. And, um, in fact, I don't honestly um, mean any deliberate disrespect uh, for him as um, an academician or somebody who's obviously put a whole lot of work into this. Um, if the descriptions of the time he spent on this, he and others, uh, obviously they, they put a whole lot of work into it. As I was reading in that last section, I can tell you, um, he is paying attention to geography in the first seven books of the Bibles. Bible. Um, he's paying far closer attention to the geography than most ever do. And uh, I can tell you that for a fact because I have been paying far more attention to the geography than I ever had before, more than I ever hear anybody do. And uh, that's why I can tell you that the geography described in the Bible does not fit the Middle East. And um, I'll get into that more extensively at the end of my comments, but I do have to say that as in a sense uh, a disclaimer that I'm not, I am not going to try to be despairing towards Fomenko at all in the things that, that I say, because what he has written here at least represents someone who has put a heck of a lot more thinking into this than most. More thinking into this than most Bible scholars and theologians. Now, what does that say? Uh, my first comment concerns what he was... Um, saying where he was drawing parallels between uh, Mount Horeb um, and Mount Sinai and Mount Siun. Well, the thing is, yeah, uh, the Bible itself draws a 
a deliberate equivalent between Sinai and Horeb. Yes, absolutely it does. Is there any equivalent between Sinai, Horeb, and Siun? I'm here to tell you, no. It can't possibly be, based first off on the travels from the one location to where we know the other location to be and the other location to be in very close proximity to the city that's called Jerusalem. Um, so that one is, I'm sorry, it's not even a stretch. It's just, it's unprovable, unfindable. Now, something that I find that was very important about um, all of this geography that he talked about in depth and all of the possible comparisons that he was making. I want to again repeat statements that he made at the beginning of this. And these statements that he made were to the tune of, I'm not claiming, uh, I'm speaking as if Fomenko, I'm not claiming that I'm right about all of my conclusions. And in fact, I'm inviting everyone to participate in coming to conclusions. And I think that that should be kept in mind as we read, without disparaging or disrespecting him or the work he's doing. Um, but here's the thing, though. History, uh, chronology, and geography have been so um, muddled. Uh, so messed with that for for anyone to be taking these these factors um, these specifics of ancient texts like the Bible our most ancient texts and trying to understand them in their true context um, is in today's day and age a pioneering endeavor so, the mere fact that he illustrates how it, it's possible that many of these locales and um, geographical specifics, such as uh, rivers or bodies of water, mountains, etc., um, could possibly be um, equivocated to places in uh, Italy and then north of Italy, um, I think what that does is it, it does the same thing that Commons Beaumont's uh, Britain, the Key to World History, in, in where he drew a lot of parallels to uh, the landscape of England and Wales, uh, to things that happened in the Bible. What I think this shows is this that this is a big world and there's a lot of land in this world and it is it is a um it is a mistake it's 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 an error to think that the only place that this could have happened is where we're told in the middle east in fact uh, the the middle east palestine egypt surrounding areas do not have the fingerprints necessary from uh, all the descriptions that we see in the Bible, specifically uh, the first seven books. Um, now, I, I do want to comment a bit on Jerusalem, because um, for one thing, he, um, he toyed with the possibilities of Jerusalem being um, in many places, anciently. Uh, okay. All right, well, so first off, um, we do have a prophecy in the New Testament from uh, Jesus or Yahshua concerning the temple in Jerusalem that it would be utterly destroyed, uh, entirely, completely. Not one block would be standing on another. Um, so obviously you can't have the temple mount in what is today called Jerusalem. That would then be an impossibility, but since those people 
that are over there day after day air humping that big wall um, don't see Yahshua as a prophet much less the Messiah I guess they're not likely to believe him but that's you know the last thing we should be doing is looking for where where a temple mount would have been because he said it's going to be absolutely utterly um, disassembled dismantled entirely so you can you can take from that what you want but now the interesting thing about Jerusalem for me I think is some comments made about it um, in the first seven books of the Bible. The, the first seven books are so dense with uh, geographical material, it's mind-boggling. So that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. And then, of course, 1st, 2nd Samuel, and others. They're full of great geographical material too absolutely but one thing that you'll find in uh, in Joshua and Judges you'll find that uh, for one thing the territory of uh, Benjamin that, that the tribe of Benjamin inherited and the territory that the tribe of Judah inherited um, it shared they shared a common border now the Bible also says that <laughs> Benjamin inhabited Jerusalem and Judah inhabited Jerusalem and the Jebusite or Iebusi e Iebusi occupied Jerusalem they occupied Jerusalem and couldn't be driven out up until the time that David took his army from Habarun or Hebron uh, to Jerusalem and specifically a section of Jerusalem called Zion, which they oftentimes translate as Zion, Zion. And the Yebusi, or Jebusite, that inhabited um, believed that the city was impenetrable. So that was the section they inhabited. And he took that. And the Bible makes it clear that Siun is the city of David. The temple wasn't built in the city of David. When Shalome, Solomon, built the temple, he built it on Moriah. And the proximity of Moriah is interesting as well. If we can get what they tell us is modern-day Jerusalem out of our heads, we'll see that this is a city in an area so large and perhaps sectioned sectioned how I mean was it sectioned by by waterways like when you think of New York City New York City has uh, five boroughs and you'll see that these boroughs are oftentimes um, they are uh, frequently separated except for like the boroughs of um, Queens and um, what is it that are all on Long Island, you know, Queens and um, I think Brooklyn. Sorry. Anyways, besides for those boroughs, um, the the harbor and the river separate what is considered one large city. And so I've had to think about that, how Benjamin occupied it and Judah occupied it at the same time and they both had their own occupations like um, they both had their own sections of this place that were within 
their respective borders. But at the same time, the Jebusite occupied two, and they could not drive them out. Not till David. So the layout of this city, I think we need to just rethink it. Um, try, to, try to start with a clean slate and rethink it. Next note, I do want to reinforce something that Fomenko was making a point of, um, but I want to make it very strong, very, very strong point here, is that the Bible never says that either Babylon or Babel or Nineveh being Nineveh were on either the Euphrates, which is the Parath, or the Hadquel, which is often uh, translated as the Tigris. I want to make that clear. I do want to make that clear. And Nineveh, or Nineveh itself, was a city far greater than whatever this thing is that they've unearthed near the Tigris today. Read the description of it in Jonah. Uh, point three. This one's interesting because he talked at length about inverted maps. And um, his perspective was coming from somebody who was a sailor um, a European sailor off the coast of the Mediterranean and how they would look at the rest of the world. Gosh, I really don't know that I agree with that perspective. Sure, I mean, uh, hey, I lived in Florida uh, for a long time and I often, uh, I wasn't far from the Gulf and I often went to the Gulf. But if I was sailing from, say, Clearwater, Florida, uh, out into the Gulf to any given area, I have to tell you, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be necessarily juxtaposing my map by my shoreline or what my outlook was from there. Um, I would very much want an objective map. And I would think that sailors who were going out to sea, and especially if they were going out to either a sea that they knew could still be uh, relatively uncharted, maybe an unfriendly sea in the sense of perhaps other navies that they may encounter, uh, Sailors that definitely wanted to find their way around and their way back home would want very concretely objective maps. I think the last thing they would want is subjective maps. But the fact that there are so many maps that can be found that are, in I'm doing air quotes here, upside down, is fascinating. It's not just Europeans that do that. Um, the Chinese do that. And who knows how many other um, civilizations of antiquity did that that we don't know about. That information's been kept from us. Now, I do find it fascinating that there was an, a relatively trustworthy source. I'm so sorry I can't remember who the source was. So, you know, just take this, what I'm telling you, with a, definitely with a grain of salt. Um, they said that um, it was maybe not common knowledge, but commented on by some writers concerning the Greeks of old, um, that they either had little to no concept of Earth's geography, or that they deliberately gave incorrect geography in their writings and on their maps, perhaps as a tactic of protecting national security and holdings. 
It's also said that the Carthaginians did the same thing concerning maps, maps of the sea and the outlying lands that they purposely produced incorrect maps. So it's just unthinkable that the powers that should not be are doing the same thing today, right? And now, I did already comment a bit on Horeb and, and Sinai being the same, but not being Zion or Zion. But furthermore, I, I do find it interesting what Fomenko is saying about volcanic activity in the sense of, say, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain, right? It is fascinating, really. Um, and the description that we see of the destruction of uh, Sodom and it would actually be Amara um, are also uh, fascinating in the sense that it certainly does sound like something volcanic. It does. But concerning the idea of Mount Sinai or Horeb being a volcano, okay, the, the pillar of cloud, which was also a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day, and these descriptions of Yahweh being um, in uh, like the thick black smoke, well, those descriptions of him being veiled in those ways are not only used when they're at Mount Sinai. Uh, it's used when Shalmei first builds the temple and it's consecrated. It says the kabod of Yahweh filled the place and it was like a thick black uh, smoke in the sense of a veil. Um, and this kabod is described as weight. Um, and the thing is, you have to remember the Bible, whether you feel like believing it or not, I'm just telling you what the Bible says, that this pillar of cloud by day and fire by night went with the Israelites where they traveled. It wasn't just at Sinai slash Horeb. Um, and it wasn't per se volcanic activity, but quite literally the voice of Yahweh that frightened the people so much. Um, so I, I get it. I get why somebody would, would look at the description of the time they spent at Sinai and think something like that. But when you consider the fact that um, many of these peculiarities of the demonstration of the glory or the weight of the power of Yahweh, the God of Israel, um, these things were made manifest in many places, not just at this mountain. And this idea that Jeremiah is describing a volcanic destruction of Jerusalem does not hold water with the rest of the Bible's description that, that Jerusalem was taken and very much um, destroyed in many ways and ransacked in many ways by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babel. So, I don't think theologians are out of line when they um, are saying that there is a certain um, metaphoric, poetic language being used concerning the events that were happening in Jerusalem because they were under two different sieges, the second one far worse than the first, and it was a horrific, horrific time. Um, and I'm going to wrap it up with pointing out something. This is a, uh, a debate 
tactic. It's called a straw man. Now, I'm not talking about your straw man, all capital letters equaling your name. Not that straw man. Um, in a debate, an opponent will create something called a straw man. The reason they create the straw man is so that they can burn it down. And it actually strengthens their argument when they can successfully do that. Now, a very uh, witty, um, sharp debater will recognize their opponent building a straw man right away, and they'll burn down his straw man before he can. They'll steal his thunder if they're listening and watching closely. Now, what I believe has been happening over in the Middle East for quite some time now is that they have been building a straw man over there. Here's how it works. You know for a fact that the powers um, that are currently pulling the strings in the world, that are probably completely deluded into thinking that they can continue to do this um, indefinitely. And I, in, in one way, I feel sorry for them. And in another way, I, I don't. Because they, they're warned. They're warned every day, all the time, by, um, by folks like you and me, by the, the word of Yahweh himself. Uh, they've been warned by Yahshua the Messiah. They've been, they've been warned. Uh, they've been told, you're not going to win. You're going to utterly fail. You're on the losing side. But they're deluded. They're utterly deluded and I think insane. Well, they've been building this straw man over in the Middle East. You see... When it comes to most other things concerning the goodness of um, not only the good morality of the law, but then again the salvation um, available in Yahshua the Messiah, Jesus Christ, they will work very adamantly to try to disprove all of these things. But at the same time, if you go to, let's say, a Wikipedia page on Sidon, and here it is right here, Sidon, more Wikipedia, okay? Sidon is the same as that Saida, S-A-I-D-A, -A, that Fomenko was reading a quote um, from somebody about concerning um, what it was like in their day. Now you see, if you go to a Wikipedia about Sidun, um, oh, it's fascinating. The characters that they're using here, this Phoenician, that's very similar to the characters that I've come up with out of all the, um, wow, the characters I've seen. Anyways, what they'll do is, when it when it works for them, they'll refer to the Bible. I mean, look at the, the first paragraph of this says um, um, Sidon, and it gives the Arabic. It's Saida, French Saida. Okay, Phoenician Sidon. All right, Biblical Hebrew, uh, the Tzadi Yod uh, Dalit Vav uh, Nun, and then the Greek and all that. Okay, it. it, it it says, it's the third largest city in Lebanon. It is located in the south uh, governorate of Lebanon on the Mediterranean coast, about 40 kilometers or 25 miles north of Tyr, and 40 kilometers or 25 miles south of the capital, Beirut. In Genesis, oh, oh, in Genesis, Sidon is the firstborn son of Canaan, who was a son of Ham, thereby making Sidon a great-grandson of Noah. So whenever they feel like it, they'll use the Bible to support the straw man that's been built over in the Middle East. And what I think is going to happen 
is at a point or points after they've built this straw man that nobody's paying attention to and everybody's just really had, they've bought into this Middle Eastern straw man that they'll use all kinds of misinformation that they control to build and strengthen this straw man to give the foolish unbible studying Western Christians the idea for some reason that the Jews got a right to be there which even if they were the house of Judah they'd still have no right to be there since they re reject Yahshua as their Messiah but they've used what trickery they've been in control of. You see, these people have been pulling the strings of the British Empire for quite a long time. And it is specifically England, uh, out of whom so many archaeologists and other figures of note, academicians, scholars, who have supposedly found all of these artifacts reinforcing the idea that this, this is the location um, of the events of the Bible. And thus this city, Al-Quds, is actually the biblical Jerusalem and somehow they have a right to be there. They're building a straw man. And what I believe part of the plan is, is that as they are trying to tear down everything else that links us to the truth of our history, our past, who we are as peoples and as we relate to the God of the Bible, and as the Bible is a direct record of history and geography and this only true God and the people that he has covenanted with and the accounts of their history and doings, world affairs, the coming of his Messiah, his uh, offer of grace, to all men through his Messiah, then his regathering um, of the tribes of Israel and um, full redeeming of them who were once cast off and lost. They're going to, I believe, at a point or points start burning down the straw man they built you see the straw man was for the support of mostly Western Christianity and um, Judaism the world over when they burn down that straw man and it won't look like they're burning it down others maybe will burn it down I think the I think the design of that is going to be to utterly weaken the faith of so many but if we remain watchful and study then we'll clearly see that all that Middle East uh, straw man is is uh, a collection of cleverly done deceptions. So that's my commentary for this time. Um, Again, Fomenko's, he's, he's into subjects that uh, have been the main subjects of my study and research. So it's just no way around uh, a good deal of commentary on that. So we'll pick up next time with section 12 
all of it looking very exciting. So until next time, I do hope all of you take care of yourselves and your neighbors.